we're going to just talk about two little sections from chapter 12, looking at solids. So the first is on the classification of solids, and there's four ways that we're going to classify them, really depending on what's making them up. So if they're made of metals, you're going to have a metallic solid. If they're made of an ionic compound, so if you have ions involved, then you're an ionic solid. Uh, covalent network, those are kind of specific. You have like some, like diamond is a covalent network solid. You have covalent bonds actually holding the, the atoms in place. And then molecular solids means you have a molecule. So a molecule, yeah, like nonmetals, like water is a molecular solid. So metallic solids, things like um, copper, iron, something like that. Uh, what you have is basically a, a sea of uh, basically all of the metal cations, the metal, the, the metals will strip off their valence electrons and donate them into this sea of electrons. So they have these sea of electrons, which makes them really good conductors of heat and electricity. So these are good conductors. Uh, heat. Good conductors of heat and electricity. So they have different properties uh, than ionic compounds would, ionic solids would. So basically you have cations, cation, cations, and then they you have a sea of electrons. And so um, that makes these things really good at, you can draw them into water, they're malleable, they're ductile, all of those things for this reason. They can uh, shift your, the, um, cations around uh, but because you have this, this buffer of uh, electrons in between so that the cations can't get too close together. Whereas ionic solids, you have cations and anions. So you might have a cation, anion, cation, anion, and then anion, cation, anion, cation, and so forth. You have all this, this you know, pluses and minuses all over the place. Now what happens with these guys is they're really brittle. So this is something like salt, right? Like sodium chloride, NaCl. Um, so if you kind of hit this thing and shift one of these rows, right, suppose these got, these rows got shifted and now and where I had a plus up there, now it's down here, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus. So I just shifted those. As soon as these two pluses get together um, or these two minuses get together, this whole molecule just kind of crumbles. And so these end up being like really brittle. It's just going to crumble. Covalent network solids. So these are things like carbon. So um, like diamond. Diamond is um, a covalent network solid where the carbon is actually covalently bonded to four other carbons, right? So you get this this um, network of carbon atoms where each carbon is um, connected to all these other carbons by a covalent bond. And that's your solid, which is crazy. So what holds the covalent network solid together um, are the covalent bonds. Uh, what holds the metallic solids together, this attraction between the cation and the ion in the um, electrons and then the ionic compounds, you have a positive and negative charge that's kind of holding them together. For molecular solids, you have molecules. So it's all those van der Waals forces that hold them together. So if you can, uh, if it's um, nonpolar, then it has London forces. So those will hold um, molecular solids together. If you're polar, then you have your dipole dipole interactions. And then if you can hydrogen bond, that's another one, hydrogen bond. So in a molecular solid, you basically have like a water molecule and that's hydrogen bonding to another water molecule, which is hydrogen bonding to another water molecule. And so you get this, um, something like that, right? So they're constantly being uh, connected to each other. The thing that's holding them together are those intermolecular forces that, that we talked about before, all those van der Waals interactions, um, hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, or London forces. So if I gave you a solid, you should be able to classify it. So I just said, what kind of solid would iron form? Well, it would form a metallic solid because it's a metal. What, what about sodium chloride? Well, that's an ionic compound, so that would form an ionic solid. How about diamond? Diamonds form um, from form covalent network solids and then any other molecules like water would form a molecular solid. So you should be able to classify those um, basic four classifications of, of solids. Um, you could also have another way to describe them is a crystalline solid versus an amorphous solid. So crystalline solids have a very regular repeating pattern just the same over and over and over again and there's a few different types of um, there we go, crystal lattices. <laughs> they repeat uh, over and over and over again, and that pe the piece that repeats itself is called a unit cell. Uh, so the unit cell can be a primitive cubic lattice, and that's when you have kind of like 
um, just think of a metal. So if you had a metal that had, that had a primitive cubic lattice that repeated itself over and over again, you'd have a metal on each one of the corners. And then that would just keep repeating over and over again. So that's kind of what that's showing over there. You could also have a body centered cubic lattice where you have um, an atom or molecule or whatever is repeating itself over each one on the corner. And then you have one in the middle. And then a face centered cubic is we have one on each corner, but then also one on each face of this cube. And that's what repeats itself over and over again. So you have these different types of uh, cubic lattices, primitive, body centered, face centered. I believe there's even more. We're just going to look at these three. Um, and that's kind of what makes up your crystalline solid. Um, an amorphous solid is characterized by a distinct lack of um, lack of order. So something like volcanic glass. So think about um, a volcano. You have it's really it's the the um, magma that comes up is really hot and it cools really fast. And it turns out it's, it cools so fast that the molecules don't have time to align. They don't really get in order. So you don't get a crystalline solid, you get this amorphous solid. So it's completely, um, it, it lacks any kind of order. Um, what else do we have? So for crystalline uh, substances, for crystal lattices, um, you can have alloys. An alloy is, um, is when you, so it's a combination of two or more elements. Usually you have metals and then something else. So here we have metals, here we have two metals, here we have metal and something else. So a substitutional alloy is when you're taking something like gold. Okay, so take AU and imagine you just had, you know, C of gold atoms there. And then you started swatch, switching out something with silver. So some of those gold atoms are now silver. You kind of replace them. So you, you mix some silver, you put some silver into the mix, and then they're actually gonna switch out. They're gonna substitute one for the other. Um, and then that's how you get a substitutional alloy. And that happens when the, the atoms are about the same size. Uh, so you just kind of put them together and they'll arrange themselves in this kind of weird way. From the surface, you won't really notice any difference. This is how you get white gold, right? What you wouldn't be able to, to it's not going to look like, like striped or anything. Um, it's going to be, you know, every, not every other one is gold, silver, whatever. It has some kind of a random arrangement, but the or the atoms themselves are going to be arranged nicely. It's just, you don't know which one's gold, which one's silver. Um, for an interstitial alloy, interstitial means um, the space kind of in between where the, the atoms are. So you have this interstitial space. The space is like, I'm sorry, the interstitial space is the space between the atoms. And you get an interstitial alloy when you take something like iron, which is pretty big, and then you add like carbon, which is really tiny. So carbon wouldn't be able to, um, it wouldn't be stable if it was trying to be like iron carbon, iron carbon, because the carbons are so small. They just kind of like sit in the middle of that space between the irons. And that's how you get steel. So you get an interstitial alloy when you have a big atom and you're adding a little bit, a, a tinier atom to it. And you can play with the properties of the, um, of the alloys by, um, by adding different elements to them or different amounts. So you can have one with a lot of carbon will have certain properties. One with a little bit of carbon will have other properties. And so that's kind of why you make alloys um, to, to change the properties of whatever metal you're looking at. So a substitutional alloy is when a second element takes the place of a metal atom. And then an interstitial alloy is when that second element uh, fills the space of the lattice formed by the metals. So really quick on chapter 12, just be able to identify some of the um, some different types of classification for solids, and then uh, a little bit about alloys.